Greetings, metalheads, and welcome to the Friday 13th YouTube channel. Today, we've got a fantastic interview, the first one for 2024. I'm going to be interviewing the one and only mighty Andy LaRock from King Diamond. Now, Andy LaRock is one of my favourite all-time guitarists and certainly underrated. So I'd like to thank Andy for doing this interview. I'd also like you guys to share this interview on social media sites. So thanks for watching, metalheads. More interviews coming soon. Cheers, Andy, for the interview. I'm fine. How are you, man? I'm good, man. Thank you so much for doing this interview, my friend. Hey, no problem. Hey, you no know, problem. you are one of my favorite guitarists of all time. Underrated, absolutely amazing guitarist. <laughs> thank you, man. That's no problem. So, Andy, so I'm going to ask you cool. some warm up questions first. Like I say, thank you for doing yep. this interview for Friday the 13th. This is the second interview we've done. The last time we interviewed you was 25 years ago on a phone interview. <laughs> Crazy. That was when you were in London doing press with King Diamond for the um, Conspiracy album. Yeah, that's right. Wow, it's crazy. Uh, you know what? That's <laughs> that's like 1990. That's like 30, 33 years ago. Yeah, well, Friday the 13th has been going on for 36 years. Oh, crazy. Yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, so I'm going to ask you some more questions first, Andy. As a guitar player, um, how did you get in guitar, into guitar? Because I believe your father was a guitarist, but you wanted to play drums. Is that correct? Yeah, well, he wasn't really a guitarist, you know. He was, he was playing like acoustic guitar and fooling around with that, you know, playing like Swedish folk songs and stuff like that, you know. Uh, but, you know, the first contact I got with like music or like like uh, as an instrumentalist, I was actually, oh, I thought drumming was really cool, you know. So I wanted to start out as a drummer, you know. But it changed pretty quickly, you know, uh, when I picked up the guitar and I realized that I can actually create some really good songs and music with the guitar, you know. So that was a, that was just a fast kind of flash, you know, with the drum thing, you know, going over to the guitar, you know. Okay, then. So, uh, so I mean and I, I think I was maybe maybe 12 years old, you know, maybe 11, 12 years old when when, when that all started. So what age was you when you first got your electric guitar and do you still own that guitar? Uh, the first electric, I think I was maybe 12, maybe 13 at the most, you know. And that was a shitty one, like a copy of whatever. I can't really remember. But I think I was like 30, 13 when I got my first kind of Ibanez, uh, Les Paul type. I think it was 13 or maybe very early 14, something like that, you know. And that's about the time when I got my first Flying V. And then, you know, I got a Gibson uh, Explorer. I think I was like 15. When I got that, you know, so I was in that kind of early, you know, and slowly learning how to play. <laughs> it took a few years, actually, you know. First, you just want to have some cool gear, you know, and then you learn how to play it, you know. So, so what was your first amplifier that went with your guitar? Uh, the first amplifier I got, that was, I think that was a small combo called the FBT, you know, like a 20-watt small combo amplifier you know the second amp i got when i was like 14 or yeah four, i think i was 14 turning 15 that was awesome partial amp you know and i had that amp for almost 10 years actually wow so i mean i mean it was, which guitarist inspired you because I, I mean i was reading it about you're very much inspired by randy rhodes and michael Schenker. what the guitarists were inspired you to play guitar um, you know, one of my first, like, idols, so to say, that was actually, I thought, you know, Status Quo was a really good band because they had such, such a great, you know, rhythms, like boogie rock, you know, was cool. So I always wanted a Telecaster because Rick Parfit, you know, the, the rhythm guitar player of Status Quo had uh, a Telecaster, you know, so, but I never really got that, you know, I have one now, but <laughs> it took a long time, you know. That was one of the first guitars. And then, of course, uh, Gibson Flying V. Um, probably because Schenker, you know, had one and uh, some other people around that time. You know, Les Paul. Yeah, I had a Les Paul too, you know. But uh, at the early days, I never had a Gibson Les Paul. That was something different, you know. Right so then. there are a lot of really cool guitars out there, you know, to get inspired by, especially now. I mean, there's so many different shapes and models and brands you know but back then it was pretty much you know fender or gibson you know yeah i think the fender les paul had a, a really good sustain sound for guitars didn't it really good yes yeah. from what I, people have told really me they had the best sustain at the time yeah 
So I mean, yeah, I mean, you're influenced by like bands like Sweet, I believe, and Slay, and all that. You were a big glam fan, wasn't you? As well as Stairs Quo, all those bands. How do those yeah, sort yeah. of bands reflect in what you're doing now? Uh, not very much, I believe. <laughs> do you think? Uh, I would say, you know, pretty early too. Of course, you know, I mean, Black Sabbath came into the picture pretty early, and uh, the dark things, you know, with Black Sabbath, I thought it was great, you know. So that inspired me quite a quite a lot actually and also bands like kiss alice cooper you know um stuff like that together you know with that glam thing you know in the mid 70s you know that i thought was really cool because i always been a fan of great melodies that i think you know slade and and, and sweet and you know all those bands i mentioned they had that you know black sabbath maybe not so much melodies you know but they had some other things you know that that that, that was really cool you know with the with the music, of course, you know, the dark side of their music is amazing, of course, you know, inspired so many people, you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, have you ever thought of doing like a glam rock project? Because you're influenced by all them bands. Have you ever thought of doing something like that? Not really, you know, I'll leave it to to the ones who are really, really dedicated to that, you know. I know my style now, you know, and I've been doing this for, I don't know, a long time, you know, 35, 40 years, you know, so I, I kind of, you know, I think I found my style of writing music and, you know, my playing style too, you know. So I'll leave that to the people who are really dedicated to 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 the glam rock things, you know. Yeah, talking of bands, I mean, a lot of people don't know this, but you was in a band called um, EF um, Band, wasn't you, many, many years ago? You know, yeah, I mean, that's very, very completely, short, completely different to what you're doing now. It's more like Dokken, Judas Priest, Persian Risk. I mean, you did, they did quite a few albums, didn't they? They did a few albums, yeah. And I was involved in their last album, I believe, you know, as, as far as I know, back in, that was very, very early, 1985. That was just a couple of months before I actually joined King Diamond. And I was called in, you know, to, to write a few songs with the guys. And then we spent uh, like a month in the studio, you know, recording it, you know. And then after that, you know, I just, you know, left the band and started with Diamond. Right. Do you actually keep in touch with those guys? Do you ever think of like doing like a reunion gig now and again? Or... Uh, not really. You know, I don't even think that uh, all of them are still, you know, uh, alive, actually. You know, I think the guitarist died like many, many years ago. The only the only guy I really, you know, in touch with there is the drummer, actually. We, we keep in touch once in a while, you know. Dog, right. Dog Elias, yeah. Okay, then, so, I mean, joining King Diamond must have been something really, I mean, like, you must have been one of the the only guitarists that he approached, I, I presume, back in the day. Yeah, well, I was, you know, 22 years old when I joined the band, you know. That, that was, like, a really big thing for me, of course, you know. And at the time, you know, I jumped between a few different bands, and you know, I was working in a music store, and uh, me and Mickey, we fooled around a little bit, you know, in different bands, you know, for a while, you know, and just jamming out and we hung out, you know, and stuff like that. And then one day he just called me and said that, hey, Andy, we need a guitarist. You really need to come down here and do this audition, you know, with us, you know. And then at that time, they'd been in the studio for about two weeks recording the Fatal Portrait. And the guitarist I had at the time did not work out, you know. So I quit the music store thing uh, the same day Mickey called, actually. Took uh, my amp and uh, one of my guitars, I went down to Copenhagen uh, and, you know, jumped into the studio, said hi to the guys, you know, and talked a little bit, you know, and listened to some of the stuff, you know. And then they asked me to do a couple of takes, you know, on a song called Dressed in White. So I hooked up my stuff, you know, my guitar and my amp and played along with it a little bit. And they captured that on tape, you know. And then it came to a tape that I thought, you know, uh, yeah, this this sounds pretty good, you know. So, and they said, you know, after a couple of hours, sounds really good, you know. You're welcome to the band. That was cool. Twenty two years old, yeah. Awesome, Andy. Andy. I mean, how did you? I mean, you know, you've got a distinct guitar sound. Not many people have distinct sound, sound guitar sounds. How did you develop that guitar sound? You know, that's really hard to say, but. I would say, you know, in the early days, I tried to copy a lot of guitarists, you know, that, right. that's what you do when you're, you know, when you have a lot of, you know, idols and you're a fan to a lot of guitarists, like, for example, 
I don't know, Schenker, uh, you know, and uh, a lot of other guitars too, of course, you know. And then out of that copying like different, you know, guitarists, you kind of mix everything up, you know, to your own style. So I guess that's it, you know. I think it's a mix between, you know, uh, inspiration from everything from Schenker to Richie Blackmore to Jeff Beck. Uh, I don't know, Angus Young, maybe, you know, uh, Tony Iommi to Randy Rhodes, Michael Schenker, Steve Vai, you know, all kinds of things. And then you just, you know, cook it down to your own thing, I believe. Yeah, I mean, just, um, as soon as we hear your guitar sound, we know straight away it's Andy LaRock. Or it's somebody cool. trying to be Andy LaRock. <laughs> cool. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, as a guitar, I mean, was your first guitar that you really started playing with was BC Rich, wasn't it? Was that your first real company that you worked with? Uh, that was the first company, yeah, I was endorsed with exactly. That was this was back in '84 or '85, I believe, something like that. '84, I believe, yeah. So I started to work with them, you know, and then we moved to the U.S. for a couple of years, and we got in touch with. Uh, with uh, the, the Beast Rich you know, head office in California. So we got endorsed by them for a couple of years, you know, great guitars. I still have all of them, actually, you know. Do you still play but, them? Uh, um, they're stored away in a storage, you know, but I'm actually planning to put it out on an auction. What do you say? Anyone really? interested? You know? Wow. <laughs> well, I'll bow you know, one off you for £100, Andy. <laughs> yeah, you know, they're just there. You know, I don't play them anymore. You know, I just look at them once in a while, you know, go down to the storage and check them out. You know, it's like, wow, great guitars. Pick them up. It's like, wow. And every guitar, you know, from BC Rich at that time was absolutely handmade from scratch. You know, mm. we went to the factory uh, many times in California, you know, and there was bunch of guys sitting there in hand carving, you know, the necks and everything. That was amazing to see, you know, paint job and everything, totally handmade, everything, you know, so very you, cool guitars, you know, but I don't really need them anymore. So, you know. You ever thought of playing them in the studio? Because I know you play Dean guitars now. I play ESP guitars. Oh, it's ESP, sorry. Yeah, right, ESP, ESP yeah. For, yeah. you know, I think for about maybe five years, five, six years, actually, you know. Right. Which I think is excellent. Dean was good too, you know, but uh, then I picked up uh, one of Mike's uh, guitars, uh, Mike Weed, uh, one of his guitars, and I said, wow, this is cool. You know, the neck and everything was just exactly how I wanted it. So I got in touch with um, ESP uh, back in, I think, maybe 17, 16, 17, something like that, you know, and I started to work out so a deal with them, you know, and I'm, I really, really like their guitars, you know, they're they're excellent, you know. So how many so guitars? That's, that's what I'm gonna use. How many yeah. guitars do you actually own then, Andy? I don't really know, man. Three hundred? No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it's not that many because if there is a guitar that I really don't like, you know, I just you know get rid of it, you know. So I got a few Gibsons, I got a few Les Pauls, I got a few Flying V's actually, and I think I might have uh, about. Seven or eight the Beats of Riches, you know, the old stuff from the 80s. And seven or eight ESPs, I believe. Some of them are LTDs as well. LTDs are great guitars too. Uh, and I don't know, maybe 35, 40 guitars total, something like that, you know. So it's not like, you know, I'm a big collector in that way, you know. Okay, then. So moving on then, Andy, we're going to talk briefly about King Diamond. What's your favorite King Diamond album that you've ever recorded? I think I have to say it's Abigail because everything just, you know, was put together in a perfect way, you know. We've been out touring with the band, you know, for a few uh, tours, both in Europe and the U.S. Uh, we knew each other, uh, working together on the previous album, Fatal Portrait, and uh, everything just, you know, went together in a perfect way, you know, the total cool feel of the album, you know, the atmosphere of that album is still amazing, you know, and it amazes me when you listen to this stuff, you can, we actually capture that right feel and atmosphere to it, you know, so 
I always go back to to, um, to Abigail when when people you know ask me about that. What's the that, that, I think that's a perfect album. You know, great songs, you know, great lyrics, and you know, we went in after being on the first U.S. tour back in '86. So this was like in December uh, 1986 that we started recording it. You know, I was really really cold in Copenhagen, dark and snow, and that was just a perfect you know timing of of recording that album. You know, I thought it was great. Everything turned out better than I could ever expect, you know. What do you think about the second Abigail album? How do you compare that to the first one? Uh, you can't really compare it, you know. I mean, it's... I mean, that first Abigail is like is like unique, you know. And, it's like the cult classic, isn't it? It's your cult classic album. Yeah, exactly. Second Abigail, yeah, cool too, but it's different studio, different persons, you know, in the band, and, you know, everything is like different, you know. So the whole album is different, you know. Okay, then. So I'm going to ask you about the new album that's going to be coming out, the, the Institute, I believe the album title's called. Yeah. When's this coming out? Is it actually finished? Because you released a single, didn't you? The Masquerade of Madness. That was released as a promotional yeah. video. But nothing's happened because I know King's been doing Merciful Fate and all the King Diamond exactly. fans are frustrated. Yeah. You know, what's what's happening have, with the album? Yeah, you know, we have songs. I sent him like a bunch of songs a long time ago, actually. And we started working on that, you know, with arrangements and such. And then the Merciful Fate tour came in between, and they've been busy with that, you know. And I think they're going to be recording like one or two singles with Merciful Fate. But I talked to King just like a week ago, and he said that you know he was going to be starting like, you know, like yesterday or something like that, you know. So he's starting with setting everything up and going to start to to record the vocals for for. The Mercer songs, and as soon as it's done with that, we're going to continue with uh, the King Diamond. So we have songs, just need to be a little bit arranged. And of course, you know, King has a lot of riffs and ideas, you know, in his head. So he needs to get that down to the computer, you know, and do some riffing and stuff, you know, too. So yeah. it's, uh, we started it, you know, but it's a long process to have it good and to have it the way we want it. Yeah, it must be very frustrating for you. I mean, like I say, I mean, King's been concentrating on Merciful Fate and we're all waiting, hoping that's going to be a 2024 release, but it doesn't look like it's going to be, is it? Or will it be? Uh, you know, it's impossible to say. You know, that's something you actually have to ask him. You know, I really hope so, you know, but as soon as we're done with a couple of songs, we'll probably release those, you know, and uh, that's all I can say, you know. But I mean, I've been busy with things anyway because, you know, it's not that, you know, Waiting for King is not that I stop doing things, you know. I I continuing, you know, writing songs and you know riffs and all that stuff, you know. And I work with a lot of a lot of other bands in the studio, producing and recording that too, you know. So I've been busy on my um, in my own way, you know, with a lot of things, you know. Yeah, I know you have. I mean, you've got like your studio, your first studio, Los Angeles. I mean, is it the same studio you've got now, Sonic Train, or you just no, changed? Now, this is a different location. You know? It's like an hour south of Gothenburg, you know. And uh, this is this is actually a better place, you know, to be. Uh, the rooms are much better, you know. And uh, I got some, you know, uh, sleeping facilities for the band if they if they decide to use that, you know. I got a small, you know, pantry, and I got like a smaller studio as well as the the little bigger one, you know, where you can sit, you know, at night and work uh by yourself you know with like putting on solos and stuff like that you know so so the rooms here are much much better than the previous one i had you know and i've been here for about i don't know 16 17 years wow awesome so it's it's a long time you know time just flies man yeah and i'm yeah. planning to be here for another i don't know 10 years maybe. let's see Okay, then. I mean, you. I mean, I've got the the album that you released um later years called ill will that was a really good album kind of reminded me of fight I mean, yeah. um, did you ever think of doing another album for for that project or band? No, not really. You know, maybe we talked about that, you know, once the album was released, but that was like a long, that was a lot of hassle, you know, releasing that, you know, and I don't know, man. I mean, we were totally into it at that time, you know, but then everything just, you know, went out to nothing, you know, because, 
we got busy with other uh, other things, you know, like Diamond back again, you know, and all, because everything with Ill Will started back in 93 when I had nothing to do with Diamond, really, because they were like uh, doing the reunion with Muslim Faith. And uh, that took a few years then, you know, until we got back with Diamond. So that started with like 93, and I think we recorded it back maybe in 95. And that was right after we started up with uh, King Diamond again. You know? So once we finished that ill will thing, I got busy with Diamond again. So, you know, but that okay, was then. cool to, to do a different thing and see how that worked out. And I think, you know, I, I still think it's a great album. Very yeah, different, but great. Yeah, me too. Yeah, definitely. I mean, working with Chuck out of death, individual thought pounds must have been something Amazing for you. I mean, Chuck's a big King Diamond fan, and obviously he must be a big Death fan. He was. It must, it must have yeah. been amazing for you. That was great, man. I mean, he was a great guy. And uh, he visited us on a few shows, you know, um, prior to uh, the time I went over to to, to Tampa or, and to, to join the, the guys in the studio. So he went down to a few concerts back in the late 80s, I believe, you know, to see us, you know. And uh, briefly said hi and all that, you know. And uh, when I flew over to uh, to Florida, you know, to to do the solos on that album, you know, they were totally welcoming me, you know. And uh, that was that was awesome, you know. And the only guys actually who were in the studio back then there was uh, Chuck, of course, you know, and uh, Steve Giorgio, you know. He was the only guy left in the studio because. Uh, Gene Hoagland left the day before I went over to the studio. So I never had a chance to meet him. And it actually took me 20 years till I met him, you know. Really? Wow. I met him at a festival, you know, later, you know, so that was, that was crazy. Man. But I All think, right. you know, it seems like people really, really like that album, you know, because it's a little different, you know. And uh, I think the solos turned out really good. And it was great working with uh, Scott Burns and, of course, uh, Chuck. Scott was the producer at the time. Yeah. And Chuck was a great guy, you know. He called me every New Year's Eve until, you know, he, he passed away. Great guy. Yeah. Really nice to work with him, you know. Super cool. Yeah, I met him a couple of times, a real nice guy. But, I mean, did you ever yeah. think of doing that tour? Because I saw that tour and Craig from Forbidden was playing guitar, obviously, because you couldn't do the tour. Well, they asked me if I wanted to join the band, even, you know. But at that time, I was really, really busy with, like, you know, I just had my second kid or about to have my second kid you know and we've been touring very heavy you know with king diamond the years before that you know so I, that break i had right there was just you know i needed that you know so i i really didn't want to go out on tour or do that you know but joining them in the studio doing the solos that was that was really cool to do that you know that was really enough for me at that time and then the year after back in 94 we started up with diamond again, you know, so that was like a slow up, a startup process with that, you know, which I thought was perfect for me, you know. I mean, you've done you've done so many recordings, like guest appearances. Obviously, you're a producer as well. I mean, it must be amazing to do all those solos for so many artists. Yeah, I love doing that. You know, people, you know, they email me and then they ask me, "Hey, Danny, what do you say about putting down a solo?" You know, on this, this, and this, and this, and that. You know, and yeah, sure, I um. Did a solo for a band here just a few days ago and uh, sent it to them, you know, and they they were totally you know, amazed by, wow, cool, man. Got some great, you know, analog rock elements in the solo. And, you know, more than we expect, you know, it's totally cool, you know. And I, I do quite a lot, you know, solos for bands, you know, which I really, really like doing, you know. So, you know, if you have something for me, let me know. Yeah, I mean, I've got this amazing idea in my head. If I had the money, Andy, to to put it to, to to you, I would. It would be you on guitar. It would be James Murphy on guitar. It'd be John Norum on guitar. It'd yeah. be Rob Halford on vocals. I can't think of a rhythm section, but it'd be probably the best fucking metal album ever. <laughs> Mickey D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, then yeah. <laughs> just just to get you with Rob, with Rob Halford and yeah, yeah, yeah. James Murphy and John Norum and a few other guitarists would be like yeah. the ultimate metal yeah. album ever in my yeah, experience. Cool. What do you yeah, think of that? Cool. Yeah, cool, man. You should you, do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, if I had the money, man, I'd do it for you, Andy. I really would. Yeah. But I mean, you've been really busy because I've been speaking to a friend of yours or a friend with Lincoln from Secret Society. You're doing yeah. the new album. Are you producing yeah. the full album and, and playing guitar with him or is it just producing? 
No, I'm not really even producing it because they, they, you know, know how to do that themselves. You know, they're putting everything together. They're recording everything. So what I'm doing, I'm mixing it all, you know. They come to me with the hard drive, with all the files, you know, and then I set everything together. Well, you can actually say I'm producing it too because I'm, I'm kind of, you know, letting them know what kind of direction I think they should go and all that, you know. But they record everything themselves, you know. But I think that's a great band, you know, or a great project whatever you will call it you know because great musicianship and uh great musicians you know and uh i think it's really interesting to have those uh, different uh singers you know uh, oh yeah on board you know on this that, that project you know i think it's great you know great stuff so yeah. they had you know you know i mean they had uh like i would say six or seven different singers now right yeah and, uh, like tony martin yeah. ripper owens matt balls yeah exactly Tony Martin, yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, great, great singers, you know, great. So that's, I really enjoy working with them. You know, they're great guys, you know, cool stuff. So what's what's the next project that you're doing? Have you got anything in, in the works or anything? Um, I'm working with uh, some small local stuff here. I, I, it's a band called Mary Lane. It's like a, more like a pop oriented thing, actually. Can you believe it? But I think <laughs> okay. that's really interesting to work with different things too, you know. I mean, if you can handle heavy metal, you can handle pretty much everything, really. But this is like a pop thing, you know. So it's a matter of getting a really good drum sound because they wanted to have a really good acoustic drum sound and then put everything on uh, on top of uh, on that, you know. That's what I'm working with now, parallel with some other stuff, you know. And then I'm preparing for Australian band coming in, mixed up everything. I don't know if you heard about them. They've got no. great followers, you know. They Young guys. Four brothers from Australia coming over here in the end of January. Uh, they're going to be here for about uh, 10, 12 days, you know, doing like an EP. Great musicians, you know, great, great guys. Mixed up everything. Check that out. The only bandana that you worked with from Australia is I Fear. Yeah, exactly. And that was a long time ago I worked with them, you know. I'm, I'm still in touch with some of the guys there, you know, but... Uh, they said something about maybe coming over here, you know, for mixing the album, but I never really heard anything back. You know, we'll see. So, so, so this um, band you're working with, what sort of style is it? These four brothers. Uh, it's mixed up everything. <laughs> All right, so it's, that's the name of the band, but they're mixing up everything together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. right, interesting. That's, that's okay. The, no, that's that's the name of the band, but they well, they they also play live and they mix up everything. They do covers, you know, to like travel around, you know, doing shows, you know, with like covers, but their own style is. You know, I would say a little bit maybe three doors down kind of style, you know, mixed with a little metallic and some of the riffs are maybe a little more poppy. You know, it's uh, it's a cool thing of everything. You know, it's, it's, it's great stuff, really. You know, you should check it out. Mix up do. everything. I will do, definitely. And then so... in, yeah, then in February, I got a, a Swiss band coming in. It's called the Dark Flow. This will be the second album I work uh, with them on. It's more like a shock rock thing, you know, little dark things with uh, some really cool elements in it. They're going to be here uh, on and off for about three months, I believe, you know. And uh, after that, you know, there is a U.S. band coming in for a mix for about 10 days called Kill Ritual, Bay Area band coming in. Yeah, I know those guys. In between, yeah, cool guys. They're very intense, you know, fucking awesome. And between all those, you know, sessions, I got like, tons of smaller things coming in too of course you know for just a few days like mastering mixing recording a few things here and there you know so i'll be busy all spring i believe you know and hopefully uh we'll start up everything with king diamond now too so i'll be busy with uh, a lot of things awesome on you know i would love you to make a little jingle for my youtube channel just like a 30 second guitar jingle riff if you ever get chance to do it for me i much appreciate it my friend cool you know, if, if you've oh, got time, oh, that is, if you've got time just to yeah. do a little riff, just just for me, yeah. YouTube channel, it'll be like the ultimate. I'd appreciate that. that man. Cool. Thank yeah, you very cool. much. I mean, why is it that you don't get enough recognition as a guitar player? Why are you so underrated? That's what I don't understand. You deserve more respect and you don't get it. Yeah. Oh, uh, man. Well, what can I say? You know, I just, I just do my thing, you know, I'm, I don't know. We've got Rob Halford as the metal god. We've got you as guitar god. Thank you. 
<laughs> You're welcome, yeah, what my can friend. I, say? I mean, I do my thing, you know, and um, well, I don't know, man. I mean, maybe you can answer that. I don't know. I just, I just think you should get more respect. I always mention you in a lot of interviews. I always say Andy the Rock is like Thank one you. of my favorite guitarists, and it's just like you. you know, just definitely need more respect. But Andy, I want to wish you all the best for 2024, and thank you so much for doing this interview. Thank you, Jason. We'll keep in touch. Definitely. Oh, absolutely. And like I say, when I'm on tour with Anvil again, if you're not busy, I'll see you at one of the shows. Super. But super cool, man. Okay, so do you have anything to say to the fans watching this on YouTube? Yeah, I really hope that, you know, everything with King Diamond starts up very soon again. And I hope to get over to UK to see you guys over there. Yeah, you don't do enough shows out, out here in the UK. King Diamond only just do odd, odd one a show. Is there a reason why you only do one or two shows? Uh, it's, it's, it's because of logistics. And I mean, it's not that we, we say we want to play there. We want to play there. It's, it's a matter of logistics and what kind of promoter you work with and everything. And I mean, we can't really travel to a place and not make enough money to be able to pay the road crew, the transportation and all that stuff, you know? So there's gonna be something, you know, behind it to take care of all those costs because it's super expensive nowadays, you know, to travel around, you know? Yeah. So there's gonna be, you know, the right promoter and uh, yeah, well. Okay, that's yeah. About it. I mean, it's not that, you know, we we pick, we wanna go there, we wanna go there, you know? I mean, it's a matter of money too, of course, you know, because as I said, you know, it's it's really, really expensive to travel around this time. And and we're we are a total of like between twenty and twenty-five people, you know, with the crew and everything. Two trucks, you know, two buses cost a lot of money, you know. It's yeah. like way, way more now than it was before the pandemic. Wow. I mean, I've I've met as I know, I've met you and the rest of the King Diamond band, but I've never met King Diamond. He's so hard to meet. I'd love to meet him. <laughs> You'll have, you'll, right. have to, you'll have to arrange it for me, Andy, just to say hello to him, because you've sound all my CDs for me in the past, but King's not sound any of them. The rest of the band have. All right. <laughs> it's all just right. like, well, just to get that Next time you meet him. <clears throat> next time you meet him. Oh, thank you, Andy. I'll be in touch, and I'll send you this interview later today. So if you could promote it, please do. That's, that's cool, man. Super. Thank you very much, Andy. Right, have, have a nice day.